<laughs> so um, thank you so much for joining me. Um, it's okay. funny because I, I been writing about raw feeding since 2014. And um, I share just everything that I'm learning as I'm learning it with my followers. And I have a dog that he was diagnosed with cancer last year, February, 2021 with lymphoma. Oh and he is still with us and doing really good. And when he came out of remission in December, and I was talking about it, and at the same time, talking about National Raw Feeding Week, one of my followers was like, if you haven't already reach out to um, Nora Lenz and learn about, you know, mm. rotational mono feeding. Nice. <laughs> and I had, I, I, your name was familiar and that concept was familiar, but it's just really something that I've never looked into in all of these years. And so I was just like, this is so perfect because finally there's something new for me that I can learn about and share with others. Um, so tell us, um, who are you and how did you find yourself in this space? What drew you to animals? Oh, geez. Uh, that's a long story. It goes back <laughs> to the mid eighties when I started changing my own diet and learning about human health and the relationship that human health has to what we put in our mouths and um, started a long journey there. And then probably maybe, I don't know, 10 years after I started changing my own diet, it started occurring to me that I needed to change my animals food too. And I started learning about what's in pet food, decided I didn't want any part of that anymore. That was probably 23, 24 years ago, something like that. And um, at that time, it was hard to get information. Mm -hmm. And I went to some seminars and just listened to some experts and um, just started crafting my own way of doing things. And it was only when my dog developed severe um, ear canal issues, you know, the ear in infection issues, um, that I really started looking in earnest at um, refining his diet. And once I started doing that and introducing the, the practice of fasting, um, once I started doing all that, um, then he really rejuvenated. And so then I started writing about it. I had started writing about what I was learning all along. Um, but then I started selling the book maybe 10, 12 years ago, something like that. And um, I just have had so much success with um, transitioning dogs in my own experience and people get back to me with their testimonials and they go out in the dog owning world and tell people about it. And it's, there's just so much success when you figure out what, what's causing problems, you know, mm -hmm. that's the, that's, what's missing from a lot of approaches. Yeah. So. Yeah. And, you know, I read that you fasted your dog for seven days and, you know, and that your dog just basically became a puppy again. Mm -hmm. And so during that seven days, was it like zero food at all? No food, just water. just water. And I actually did 11 days with him early oh. on. Um, he was 11 years old and I fasted him for 11 uh, days and he completely rejuvenated. He became a puppy again. Um, and I've had this, the own, my own experience with fasting because I fasted myself for 18 days on water and uh, I went away to a, a, <clears throat> a clinic to do it a supervised um, water fast and um, experienced the same thing with my health. And, but that was after I had done it with my dog. I had wanted to, it's a big investment to go off and, you know, leave your job and your home for a month and a half and go to yeah. another place and, and do a fast. And that's how long it takes, including the refeeding. So, um, so I had done it with my own dog, wanting to do it myself, you know, for years and years and finally got the opportunity. But he became so puppy-like. I mean, I was just trying to clear up his ears, right? I just wanted his ears to be clean. And he just turned into a puppy and he ended up living to 19. Oh, and wow. the last, so many 11s come up in the story, but for the last 11 years of his life, he didn't visit a vet once. Not one, not one case of sickness in mm -hmm. that whole time. And that's my idea of success. That's what yeah. I want to import, impart to other people you know, no bad visits, no sickness, no symptoms at mm -hmm. all. 
Yeah. I love that. So, you know, I was reading, um, or I was watching a video of yours about allergies and it really hit home with me because I have a dog that has food sensitivities and he has environmental allergies and, um, how I found myself with raw feeding was just basically trying to help him overcome that. Um, and switching over to raw is what did it for, for him. I mean, he still has issues here and there, but it really is instead of reaching for medication, I now adjust the diet and, yeah. and it helps him. So what can you share with me, your thoughts on dog allergies and why, you know, I think in the video you called it like the allergy con. Mm -hmm. Yes, because it's so ingrained in our culture now and in our thinking, like much of medical philosophy or medical theory is ingrained in our thinking. Um, allergy is just something that was introduced. It was the theory that was introduced like 115 years ago, and it never made sense from the beginning, but people embraced it. And most of all, the medical industry embraced it because it gives them the power they can, they can do your, they can do testing on you. They can do testing on your dog. They can give you drugs to suppress the symptoms. They can tell you to stay away from the triggers and whatnot, but they will never tell you what's causing all of that stuff to come through the skin. And, um, you know, our, my feeding methods are based on natural hygiene and natural hygiene is all about the inner terrain, keeping the inner terrain clean. And we get told so much about how it's our outer terrain. That's important. Like wash your hands, wash mm -hmm. your this, wash your that. Well, what about our inner terrain? Inner, the inner mm -hmm. terrain is what determines whether there's going to be disease or not. And if it's polluted, that stuff has to go somewhere. If you eat so much junk or your dog eats so much junk that the primary organs of elimination can't keep up, Mm -hmm. Then the stuff comes through the ears. It comes through the skin. It develops in tumors. It gets stored in fat cells. It makes dogs fat. It wreaks havoc with the functioning of vital organs. So that's the problem that we need, that we need to look at. Mm -hmm. And nobody out there in the medical world, even in the holistic medical world, is telling us how to do that, how to clean up the causes. I can't tell you how many people have come back to me and said, my dog was diagnosed with, with um, allergies. And I kept this chart on my refrigerator that I would refer to because he was allergic to basically everything. Well, he's still exposed to those things. He still eats those things that he was supposedly um, sensitive to or allergic to. And they don't bother him now because his inner terrain is not polluted. Mm -hmm. So um, a lot of those things, those food sensitivity issues, it's, it's hard to talk about it in one general umbrella term because some so-called food sensitivities have to do with foods that don't belong in dogs in the first place. Mm -hmm. And others have to do with, um, like everybody says that chicken is a common allergen, but so many people have said to me that when I, when I started decreasing the fat in my dog's diet. When I started doing rotational mono feeding, when I was feeding him, when I was giving him meat days, I would include chicken mm -hmm. and it no longer bothers him. I mean, everybody, almost everybody tells me that. That's really interesting. Yeah, because chicken gets a lot of bashing and I think it's because everybody feeds it. It's a go-to, right? It's cheap, yeah. it's accessible and it's very fatty. I mean, turn, go buy a chicken at the grocery store and turn it over and look at the globs of fat and um, see if you can find a wild bird that looks like that. You won't find a wild bird that looks like that. Yeah. Yeah. I feed my dogs a goose and it's astounding how lean it is. I mean, it looks really, like even goose and goose is probably fattier than a lot of, because it's waterfowl, yeah. right? It's probably fattier than a lot of um, yeah. other meat. Yeah. So it's like, it's, it's wild goose. And it, it is, I was shocked when I got it. It was just like, wow. I mean, of course it was trimmed up for me, but you know, you would expect like maybe some, maybe even a little marbling, like you would mm -hmm. see with venison yeah. or something, but nope, it's super lean. So I'd be interested in finding out what your source is on that. I know a friend of mine, she, her, she and her oh, husband, really? hunt. yeah, <laughs> they hunt no. and, and okay. they, when they get too much, they call me up and, and give it oh, to me. Nice friend. <laughs> so, um, so, you know, so with, um, 
monorotational feeding, or actually before we go there, what does it mean to clean the inside? So like, what exactly are we looking at? To answer that question, you have to look to the source of the waste. Mm -hmm. And that is anything that can't be used by the body. So what we have to look to is nature. And I'm always saying that nature is our only objective teacher because what do you know what do wild dogs eat they eat the bodies of wild prey and when they can't get wild prey they go off and eat the raid the apple orchards or they go to the blueberry field or whatever and eat their fill of fruit well um that means anything except anything that we can't find wild dogs eating is going to create waste in the body and so many um so many dog owners are still combining um, incompatible foods together in the same meal. And the problem with that is there are, there's only one chemical, digestion is mostly chemical, and there's only one chemical environment that can be created in the gut at a time. And if you're feeding protein, then the chemical environment is going to be acidic. It has to be in order to break down proteins. Well, if you're feeding plant foods at the same time, plant foods require an alkaline environment to be broken down. Mm. So anybody that knows anything about chemistry knows that acid and alkaline, they um, neutralize each other. Mm -hmm. And that means more of the food is going to become waste and less is going to become, and less is gonna be usable. So if you do that day after day after day, right. and hardly anybody doesn't do that, even bar feeders do that, home feeders do that, but particularly with commercial food, because then you got cooked meats in there in the mix too, and they're gonna be hard enough to, to break down. But um, when you have that miscombining happening on a daily basis, you have a situation where the primary organs of elimination aren't able to eliminate all the waste by the time another meal is coming mm -hmm. in. So you have a backlog and the backlog builds. And so the body, you know, the, it can't stay in the colon. It has to be stored elsewhere. Mm -hmm. So like you have closets for stuff in your house. That's what tumors are for the body. It's like, what am I going to do with it stuff? Well, I'll put it out of here. I'll put it here. It'll be out of the way. Nobody will see it. Won't bother us. It won't, you know, get in the way of vital functioning and whatnot. So um, that, you know, that's what happens. The backlog builds and that's the, that's the cause of disease mm -hmm. and, and of story right there. That's it. The cause of disease, putting too much stuff in the body that can't be cleanly digested. Interesting. So, and so basically with mono rotational feeding then, so that leads into, that's why we will be feeding a meal, of protein and, you know, and we want, and then a separate meal of, you know, carbs. Cause I usually feed vegetables for the fiber in them, but I would separate that out and put it over here and then a separate meal mm -hmm. for fat. Yes, absolutely. Um, we have meat days and we have plant days and um, the it's rotational mono feeding. It's RMF for short. Um, and, um, you know, this, it just kind of evolved. It started like 10 years ago when I developed a protocol for somebody and I said, okay, this person is not going to be open to feeding raw meat every day. Mm -hmm. I'm going to have to, you know, put something together that gives them some options. So I offered these different protocols, right? And that got me thinking, everybody wants that, right? Everybody yeah. wants to think that they're picking the option that's best for their dog. Yeah. So we've sort of refined it now so that, um, you know, when you're brand new and, and your dog is, um, is already dealing with some disease conditions and um, especially like cancer, um, but then when a dog has been highly medicated, you know, we, we look at these various factors and what we know is that fasting causes dogs to cleanse really or detox really fast. Mm -hmm. And since plant foods are so easy for dogs to break down and they go through the body so fast, um, some plant foods are already broken down for dogs, like fruit. Fruit is already broken down. There's not much that needs to be done there. Mm -hmm. So, um, so that means the body is going to have more energy to devote to 
cleaning up the backlog, cleaning up the waste, healing the disease. So sometimes we want that process to happen quickly and other times we wanna slow it down. And the times we wanna slow it down is when a dog has been on prednisone for five years, has been on, um, what's the one, what's the new one? Apoquel yeah. for a couple of years, um, Cytopoint, um, the flea meds, the regular administration of the trifexis and um, you know their Brovecto, all of those. When a dog has had the full treatment of all that stuff, then they probably want to start with a high meat rotation because that will slow down the cleansing. And humans discovered this for us a long time ago when we decided to, you know, start eating according to our biological, you know, adaptations. And we found out that if we started that really fast, we would get flu-like symptoms, we'd feel weak. So all you have to do to combat that problem is to keep some of your old foods that you used to eat in your diet. And that allows your body to be working more on digestion instead of having all of this energy and time freed up to cleanse and heal. So because cleansing and healing is not fun, it's sort of your comeuppance because mm -hmm. you messed up, yeah. right? Unfortunately, dogs have to pay the comeuppance when we mess up. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. <laughs> And so what are the symptoms, um, that we would normally see? Cause I like when people talk about when you switch the raw, um, like you'll see, you know, like increased tear yeah. stains and goobers and some, maybe some stuff coming out yeah. of the ears, mucousy, um, stool or loose stool, um, maybe even sometimes increased shedding. Um, I've seen dogs have even a greasy coat just for a short period of time as they're going through that. Is it something similar to the cleansing that you're talking about? Yes, all of those things can be associated with detox or cleansing or healing or whatever you want to call it. And it can be worse when these dogs have had mm -hmm. lots of drugs because the residues of the drugs are very acidic and they will start coming through the skin. And when they do that, they really, um, they can cause a lot of um, discomfort to the okay. dog. They can cause scabbing and inflammation and it generally can get worse before it gets better. I imagine mm -hmm. there are lots of RMFers out there, rotational monofeeders, previous ex RMFers out there telling everybody that the diet ruined their dog's health. Just like um, it happens in the, in the human world that mm -hmm. people will start eating a really good diet and they'll get the flu or whatever. And then they'll go, that diet is crazy. I almost died on that diet. And so, and the same thing will happen with dogs. I mean, it will look worse before it looks better and it's mm -hmm. just stuff coming out and it has to come out. But most of the time the bad, you know, those are rare exceptions. We still see that very rarely, even though the app, the incidence of this administration of these drugs is growing. Mm -hmm. um, we still see that rarely. In most cases, people just go, my dog was allergic before no problems now whatsoever. Um, my dog had IBD, no problems whatsoever. And IBD is something that clears up fairly quickly. Mm -hmm. um, any kind of chronic um, digestive disease is obviously caused by food. So yeah. removing the cause will allow the body to clean it up. Nice. Very um, nice. And so how does someone even start, um, go about switching their dog to rotational monofeeding? Good question. It's so easy. Um, and a lot of people want to do it gradually. It doesn't need to be done gradually. You don't have to lift a burden gradually. Um, the, the, more, the most gradual thing that I recommend is keeping high meat, high, a lot of meat days in, in the diet. And that gives the body more work to do and um, frees up less energy for healing and, and cleansing. Um, but for most people, I recommend, you know, especially if they're coming from a, from kibble feeding, you don't want raw meat meeting up with kibble in the gut. I don't know. In my early days of raw feeding, I made that mistake of feeding raw meat and kibble together. Maybe everybody does that in their journey. I don't know, but I had a real mess and I, you know, I hear, um, I had that experience. Yeah, <laughs> I hear from people that and I read on forums and groups and whatnot that um, people do that. They mm -hmm. introduce it and they get away with it. 
I didn't know I had a huge mess on my hands and yeah. I had a very sick dog for like 24 hours. Yeah. And, um, so you definitely don't want to do it gradually. Um, I recommend that people just fast their dogs for a day and that usually allows the digestive tract to clear out. And then because all of these problems are created, these transitional problems that have to do with the first day of feeding are all about what's already in the gut. If there's mm -hmm. something sitting there, raw meat is going to come in and sit on top of it and raw meat putrefies. And even though dogs are set up to eat putrefied meat better than we are, um, it's still going to produce a big mess that the body is just going to opt to get rid of in most cases, which means it's going to come out as vomit or as diarrhea. Mm -hmm. um, you definitely don't want to do that. So, um, so that's the cause of all the problems. So if you can just get the digestive tract clear for a whole day, then you can feed, you know, anything within RMF the next day and it's fine. Now, sometimes people coming in will have a problem even with one day of fasting. And the alternative that I offer to people for that is feeding a uh, plant food that I have offered to dogs many, many times and a very rarely seen even a kibble addicted dog turned down and that is cooked yams and cooked quinoa. Mm. Um, you just mix those 50, 50, or you don't have to add quinoa at all. You can just do, you know, cooked yams. And the next day you see orange poops and that tells you that the digestive tract is clear. And that means you can start, you can start the next day because plant foods, like I said, will go through the gut pretty fast. Yeah. Okay. That's a really good tip. Thank you. When it comes to feeding this way, do you suggest that people maybe take a step back from supplementation? Cause that's the biggest thing. It's like my biggest pet peeve when it comes to raw feeding is I see people come to raw feeding and first they want to know how to start raw feeding. And then the second question is what are all the supplements that I need? Where it's just like, you don't know right. if you need supplements yet. Why are you asking? Because they perceive that it's deficient. And mm -hmm. that's like, that's like failure. You know, you're just assuming that it's going to be a failure to begin with. I am just not into this supplementing thing at all. There is so much money to be made out in the marketplace oh. where, for selling supplements. It seems like anybody who's telling you how, sup how great supplements are either got their information from this system that's teaching people that the nat that natural foods are deficient or somebody that's already selling that stuff. And, you know, it, there's more marketing in it than truth. Um, there is a book called, um, called Whole, W-H-O-L-E by T. Colin Campbell. And he talks about this idea of um, using fake food fragments to supplement the diet. And he, he cites all of these studies that are sitting on shelves collecting dust because they don't make anybody money, but they prove unequivocally that people who take supplements don't do as well mm -hmm. as people who don't take yeah. supplements. And they actually run studies and they'll have, you know, say a hundred people, a thousand people or whatever with the same disease condition, they give 50% of them this, the supplements they get, they don't give 50, you know, the control group, any supplements and the control group does better than the supplemented group. And mm. we don't have those studies on dogs because nobody's doing them. Yeah. Right? There's no money in that. You, right? you got to find no someone money. who's willing to pay for it. And right. if it's not going to ultimately lead to them making more money, they're not going to pay for it. And, exactly. and that That's is not surprising to me. I have anemia and, um, for years I was taking iron supplements. And I mean, it was one of those where I wasn't consistent in taking them because it never seemed like they were working. And a friend told me about a company called ancestral supplements where their supplements are actually just the meat, like grass fed beef and the different organs and grass fed beef. And so I started taking the spleen and saw a difference immediately. And I don't even have to take as much as the bottle recommends it's in, it's part of my diet. And it's just like, someone told me years ago, the difference between like taking a vitamin C pill versus eating an orange. It's like, when we're taking that pill, 
we lose out on all of the other things in the orange that make that vitamin C so um, effective. And right. that has really stayed with me when it comes to choosing things for my dogs. It's like, if I am going to choose a supplement, I want it to be basically be a concentrated version of the food where they took a lot of the food, air dried it or freeze dried it, broke it down to a powder. And here you go, rather than um, just one nutrient that they've right. isolated right. and, and it's now synthetic. And that's what I'm giving to my dogs. Right. The problem with that is that even when they do that, it's missing the context of the food because yeah. the, there are things that you can't just take the water out of food. When you take the water out of food, other things go with it too. Mm -hmm. And since we've only, you know, we've only identified, I've heard this 10% of all the nutrients in food. We don't know what we're oh, wow. we don't want, we don't know what we're losing out on when we're when we're dehydrating food or when we're fractionating it in any way. So I think the best way is to do no supplementation at all. I have never supplemented a dog's food in my life. Um, and so many people have been liberated from this idea that they have to spend so much money yes. on these it's, it's a hugely expensive industry, right? There's mm -hmm. a reason why they're so expensive. And it's because you have to pay for that whole food. And then you have to get it down into this, you know, packageable form. And that takes a lot of it, right? It takes a lot of the whole food and it takes a lot of labor and um, machinery mm -hmm. to get it down into that form. So it's, it's very expensive. I'd much rather have people, um, paying that using their money for real food and just going yeah. to the store or finding the best possible source of food. And it is out there. You do, you do have to little, do a little bit of footwork to find mm -hmm. it. Um, but not necessarily if you have a small dog, like I have a 12 pound dog, I have one 12 pound dog to feed. I can go to the Asian store, buy a six pack of quail and that's her food for two weeks, mm -hmm. you know? And along with the other, you know, the plant foods that I buy for her, that's the empowerment that I want to give to people. But if you have multiple dogs, like you have big dogs, mm -hmm. you have four dogs, um, it really behooves you to go out looking into the, you know, raw feeding world and see what's out there, yeah. uh, you know, acquisition wise, supply wise. Um, but as far as supplements go, I just don't recommend, I recommend giving all of them up and just uh, and just feeding cleanly digestible foods. I don't think that supplements are made use of by a dog's body because of that missing context. Yeah. There's there, you know, there's more risk in that than there is in the deficiency risk. Mm -hmm. Deficiency is what we always think about because when you can add something into the diet that gives some, some marketer out there an opportunity to sell you something. Yeah. And that's why we're always being told, add something, add this, add that. That's... No, what you mostly want to do is take stuff away. Yeah. You want to remove the cause. You want to remove the waste. Yeah. A friend of mine often says that when she notices that someone is constantly talking about adding stuff, but not really being specific, but just talking about it, talking about it and deficiency, deficiency, she was like within a year or so, they're going to come out with the product and everyone's right. already, everyone's going to be primed to buy it because they've been telling them about adding and adding it. And I was just sort of like, oh my gosh, that's right. kind of, inter that's an interesting thought. And it's one of those things where with the pet industry, you know, I feel like I, I think there are so many people who are in this industry for, because they love animals and for a good reason, yeah. but you also have to make money. And right. it's not a place where there are many people that are stopping you or standing in your way of producing um, products. And I notice as a blogger, um, I get contacted by companies all the time to promote their things. And the number of websites that are strictly focused on supplements for dogs or pets is astounding. I mean, I, I, get, I, I get emails from them all the time and they, the people that I'm talking to can't tell you anything about, I mean, now I just don't even bother responding to the emails or if I do, I just say, no, thank you. But they don't really know anything about the products that they're doing, like the sourcing or how it was processed. And, you know, mm -hmm. 
who is it? Who, what are your reviews? I mean, I had one person where I told her, you know, cause she was like, I was hoping you can do a review. We'll send you the stuff. And I, and I told her, I was like, it takes three to six months for me to do a review on a supplement. And I was like, because I need to see how it's going to do with my dog over the long haul. And, um, and she was like, oh no, 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 you'll see improvement right away. And I was like, well, no, that's the honeymoon period. You know, when you add something new, a lot of times the dog will rebound and stuff, but will they stay that way a month later, six months later? And it's like, if they're not, I want my followers to know that, you know, in my experience, this didn't, this wasn't the thing, um, because I have had that happen in the past and they didn't, they were just sort of like, oh, okay, well then never mind. And that was my answer right there. It's like, you guys don't even have faith in your product to allow me to give it a proper review. There, yeah, there's there's so much money, and to me, it's this is a, this involves a major personal sacrifice for me because I make no money. I have only information to sell, mm -hmm. only information. I don't sell any products. I wish that there were some supplements out there that I could say, "Hey, buy this. This is great mm -hmm. for your dog." You know, I could retire. I'm not retired. <laughs> I have to work. Um, I hear so, you. Yeah, I it's. Um, you know, you can tell when somebody's following the truth, when they have to make personal sacrifices for mm -hmm. it. And um, that's a major personal sacrifice to not have anything to sell. Let yeah. me tell you. Well, Perpetual poverty. Nora, thank you so much for taking the time to talk to me about this. I'm like super excited. You sent me some great links that I'm diving into. I'm going to check out your book and <laughs> I mean, this is probably going to be my obsession for at least the next six months, because um, I love just the idea of doing something different and seeing, you know, what will happen with my dogs, especially since they have been raw fed for so long. I think that yeah. it's a mistake to think that just because I switched to raw feeding, I'm done. You know, there's still right. so much to learn about them. And I've learned so much from you today because right now our community is so focused on balance. And I know that the way feeding this way will scare a lot of people because it's like, what right. about balance? But right. it's like one thing that I've always struggled with, with the idea of balance is, you know, and I got this from a friend, which is a balance according to whom it's like, who is telling me what, what guidelines am I following? Because there are several guidelines out there. And going back to what you said earlier about how we actually only know 10% of the nutrient breakdown of food then that just blows everything out of the water because we're balancing and we don't have the complete story yet. So are we right. really doing that? And so yeah. I'd rather focus on something that works and, and that is working for other dogs than focus on these arbitrary goals that no one right. can support. Especially when this whole idea of balance came from industry in the first place, because mm -hmm. they wanted to be able to put those words on their, on complete their bags of dog food, complete and balanced, complete. And, you know, when you listen to canine nutritionists, classically trained, they will use those words left and right because it's their bailiwick, right? Mm -hmm. Well, look at the wolf, watch the, what the wolf is eating. How do you extrapolate that and call it balanced? Mm -hmm. How can you say that a bag of dog food is balanced? You know, I just think we have to throw that, that term out completely and start fresh. Um, I love this. <laughs> I'm so happy. <laughs> I, I can't wait to see what happens with your older dog because I, people are asking me all the time if it's too late to start their mm -hmm. dog on you know, RMF or change their diet or whatever. Oh, it's too much stress. It's too this, it's too that. No, it's not stressful to lift the burden. It is not stressful to lift the burden of a dog. And if, if something in the diet is creating a burden such that disease is present in the body, then it's not, it's, you're doing your dog a favor mm -hmm. to, to lift the burden. Yeah. So, absolutely. and they show you too. They, I've had so many people tell me my dog hasn't, li hasn't, went to gone to the toy box and and grabbed a toy for years mm -hmm. and they're suddenly going to grab their toys and they're playing with their younger siblings and yeah. you know I hear these stories every day well, so I hope I that you'll be hearing my story soon <laughs> well thank that. you so much I so appreciate this Sure thing. Anytime, Kimberly, and feel free to reach out if you need guidance along the way too. Oh, definitely. Well, you've got a lot of experience, so this, but this is new. So feel yeah, free to yeah, reach out. I'm, this is good. I am so excited. This is going to be a great path. 
Hey guys, it's Kimberly. So it's been a little more than a month of following the rotational model feeding model with my dogs and they are doing great. I have noticed that Rodrigo has experienced less joint pain and he usually was taking pain medication at least two times a week and he hasn't had any in several weeks. So that is really fantastic for us. Um, I love this diet because the book, which Nora was kind enough to send to me and I'll put a link in the notes below, just makes sense. I don't agree with everything in the book, but there's a lot of things in the book that I do agree with. And this is what made me want to give this a try. I don't believe in starting a diet without or or a condemning a diet or a theory without at least giving it a shot first, because I'm not a veterinarian, nor am I a nutritionist. So the only way for me to really know is to do a lot of reading and try it out with my dogs. And so far, I'm liking what I'm seeing. Of course, I have made some modifications because this is going to be the best fit for my dogs. I do have a blog post coming that details every single thing that I'm doing and what I'm experiencing, and I'll put a link to that in the notes below. But for now, to be clear, I have three meat days, and that's basically muscle meat, bone, organ meat. I do add a small amount of plant material to my meat days. <gasps> Shocker, but I have a theory for that. That will be in the blog post. I do have fasting days. I have modified fasting days. I have plant days, and I do keep fat in my dog's diet, which is something that's not... Um, promote it with RMF because the belief is that the reason why our dogs are so sick is because of the excess amount of fat in our dog's diet. I have a different theory. I think one of the reasons why our dogs are so thick is because they are not getting enough exercise. So whenever I look to how I'm going to feed my dogs, I take inspiration from wild dogs, from wolves, from other raw feeders, but also from the longest living dogs around the world. And one dog that always pops into my mind is Maggie. She is a Kelpie. I think she lived until she was 34. And two things about her lifestyle that all has always stuck with me is one, she drank raw milk on a daily basis because she lived on a dairy farm, I believe. And she followed her human around all day long on the farm. So she was getting miles and miles of exercise on a daily basis. Our dogs sit on the sofa or sit in their yard on a daily basis. They are not getting enough exercise. So I don't think it's necessarily the fat for all dogs. I think it's the exercise. So that's why I'm okay with adding the right amount of healthy fats trimming fat where needed on meat when it's just not necessary, but healthy fats like sardines, raw goat's milk, kefir, homemade yogurt, um, that is healthy fats. And I don't mind adding that to my dog's diet within reason. But I also increase the amount of exercise my dogs get on a daily basis because in reading this book and following this diet and being part of this community, it's something that really stuck out that I felt my dogs were missing. So I will wrap up that blog post and put a link to it so you guys can check it out and see in detail what I'm doing and why. And um, thank you so much for taking the time to watch this video. The last video is coming up next, and that is my chat with Rodney Habib. Thanks, guys. Bye.